and uh, I'm going to answer as best as I can, but also uh, I don't claim to know all the answers, so if I don't know, then I don't know. If it's theoretical, I'm just going to give you my theory, all right? But uh, I do want to answer as best as I can, all right? And I'll try to do the best that I can. Okay, uh, who has the first question? Who wants to ask the first question? All right, go ahead, Brother Randall. All right. Um, uh, bat, bat, um, baptism. Who has, who has authority to baptize? Because in this, you know, most of the scriptures I've seen, and this is what I believe, that, that, that you have to be of, of authority to do it. And I, so my question is, can anybody... Baptized. Yes, that's a very good question. So let's first of all go to the book of Acts, chapter 16. Acts 16. And then I want you to go to Matthew 28. Acts 16 and Matthew chapter 28. So what I notice in the Bible so far, and I could be wrong, but every passage that I find in the Bible about people getting baptized, it's always, like Brother Randall said, a person of authority. So it is somebody who has the ministerial position in which uh, they're the ones who baptizes a person. It seems to be that way. If we were to think the first baptism in your Bible with John the Baptist, these people, they were not uh, baptizing each other, but rather John the Baptist was baptizing them. And usually it's common sense with people that when they do a, some kind of special ordeal, that usually it has to be done not by random Joes. It's usually done by people in authority or somebody, something, somebody with a credible background, right? Uh, let's be honest, if you want to get your diploma, you don't want to just get it from a random Joe. You want to get it from somebody with a credible background. If you want someone to uh, ask, the, uh, uh, ask the blessing for your child or to do a funeral or something like that, you want to ask someone with a credible background. So it would be natural, the same thing with baptism. Now let's look at Acts chapter 16. We'll notice right here that this is a great case of verse 30 where the, we know about the jailer that he asked about salvation, 31. Uh, Paul led them to salvation, verse 32. Paul uh, spoke, preached the word to the rest of his family. Verse 33, Paul was the one uh, who baptized them. Now, you'll notice also it's as if they were designated or positions of authority in 1 Corinthians 1. Go over there, 1 Corinthians 1. It's as if somebody had to be designated. Designated. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice right here that Paul did not do much baptisms, actually. Now, we know that uh, the command in Scripture is when you believe on Christ for salvation, you should get baptized as soon as possible. So that is uh, what uh, we urge in churches. Well, why didn't Paul do that then if it's commanded to get water baptized? He's certainly not a hyper-dispensationalist. So then it stands to reason that he had designated other people to baptize for him. So there's, so notice right here, there had to be some credible background, somebody who designates the position to do that. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you'll notice verse 14 through 16. He didn't baptize many people there. He says that he didn't baptize much. Verse 17 is more plain over there. Uh, now look at Matthew 28, Matthew 28. Now here's the other side, though, the other side. Throughout history, I'm very certain that there were normal Christians who baptized other normal Christians. You might say, why is that? A good example is probably the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists, they believed in receiving their baptism again. Why? Because their first baptism is unscriptural. Yeah, amen to that one. We don't believe in baby sprinkling. So they believe uh, that it's got to be an adult conversion. And then once a person has the not saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they can be baptized, not baptism for salvation. So then uh, the Anabaptists, that's why they looked cultic to the mainstream Christianity and so-called Christianity, which was Roman Catholicism and then unfortunately the Lutheran Church that time. 
So because of that, they look like radicals or cult, especially if you get people baptizing each other. See that? But that doesn't mean that we condemn them and say that they're unscriptural because you have to think about cases. And I get comments and emails from people online that they're trying to find somebody to baptize them, but they don't have somebody out there who's a safe Christian to baptize them. So some are even wondering if they should baptize themselves, actually, which is, which is very, very sad and unfortunate. And that's why we need more missionaries out there. And that's why I do this online ministry. Why? So that I can help them and then try to lead them to a missionary because I'm sure missionaries could use more members and they'd appreciate that anyway. So that I, I try to do that. That's why I never gave up this online ministry. It's to do that, to help these people out there. Uh, but uh, know this is that my church is not an online church. It is a local independent Baptist church and it will always be. I do the online as a side. Why? Because there's nobody out there to minister to them. So I do that on the side to reach to those people. All right, now, anyway, let's go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Notice that Jesus Christ, in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, we know this can apply to us, too, because Jesus Christ will always be with us, you compare that with Mark 16, go preach the gospel to every creature. This is a commission for everybody. It's not just positions of authority. See that? If that's the case, then verse 19, we are commanded to baptize them too. So it seems to point out on the other side that a saved Christian can have the authority to baptize a person. Well, what's the most biblical? Because we have to go by the most biblical route. So I can't give a 100% this is right, this is wrong, but I can give you the most biblical answer. The most biblical answer is this, is that we see throughout the Bible that Jesus Christ, he does give the commission that everybody, that, uh, that Christians, they are to baptize each other. But when we see that action put into place throughout all the verses, it was always people who had that position to do it. So it's better to be safe than sorry. So then we do that. But I don't bash other Christians who are truly, if this is 100% true, they really have nobody out there and no pastor to minister to them. And they're all alone. I don't blame them if they get a fellow believer to baptize them. And I'm not going to call them a heretic. Okay, then. Do we have uh, other questions? Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I got that question, too. Yeah. The easiest answer is there's an error in your King James Bible, and it should be corrected with Greek and Hebrew. All right. No, no, no. I'm serious. Why are you all laughing? You know, First Corinthians 15. All right. I'm glad that the church realizes that, right? Like, they know uh, what kind of pastor they get or what this preacher believes in. They don't just come to a church, and then the pastor's all abstract and mysterious, doesn't reveal his doctrine clearly so that he can grow his member. All right, I'm glad that you know what I stand and believe in. It's good to be in a meeting like that. Imagine you had a, a blowout with a bunch of people. You don't know from Adam, and then they don't, you don't know where they stand as a Bible believer. They're all abstract, and then one of the preachers all, all, all of a sudden pulled out a modern Bible version. You know, Let's see Christians shout and run the aisles after that. You know? So it's good. That's why we have this. We have this blowout so that we can each other feel refreshed. Sure, we have different ministries, how we handle things, different convictions, but at least we know the main doctrines, what we agree upon, and we, we, we just fellowship more freely in here compared to a non-denominational church. My members here have been to non-denominational churches, and you know how fellowship is like. It feels very restricted. You don't feel free. But when we have meetings like this, a lot of you would tell me, man, this is such a blessing. I feel free. It's like I found people who agree like I do. It's a blessing. We don't agree every single detail, but at least we found the closest people who can agree the closest to you. And that's why you can feel that closeness of the atmosphere and fellowship. All right. Now, 1 Corinthians 15. So then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5, it says, And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And then notice right here, verse 7. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Verse 8, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Now, here's the key. Who is the 12? Look at Acts 1. Acts 1. 
It's not Judas Iscariot. It's not Judas Iscariot, but there are 12. There are 12 apostles. Well, uh, I think you're going to say Matthias, but Matthias wasn't there. How do you know that? Look at what the Bible says in Matthew, uh, Acts 1, verse 22. Acts 1, 22. Look at this right here. He, wasn't an, he was not an apostle when he saw Jesus' resurrection. Well, then why did Paul call him the 12 apostles? Because it's the timeline of 1 Corinthians 15. So Paul obviously wants to say the 12, preach, uh, the 12 apostles here. That's respectful. He's going to recognize Matthias' apostleship. But let's see right here, Acts 122. Beginning from the baptism of John, unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a what? Witness with us of what? 1 Corinthians 15 says what? That the 12 saw what? His resurrection. So it's referring to Matthias. Uh, verse 23 it's, uh, and they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Uh, verse 26, they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. And he was what? Numbered with the eleven apostles. Because he's numbered with them, Paul's going to recognize that number and say twelve apostles. All right, good question. Do we have uh, other questions? Don't be afraid to ask any question. No question is a dumb question. Yes, sir. Uh, no. Revelation uh, 21. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. 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 Okay, then. So then it sounds like there's like uh, two questions here. Let me make sure I clarify this. So uh, your questions, uh, you have a lot over here, but it sounds like it's mainly two things. So one, uh, is there no sea, literally no ocean at all? Secondly, uh, tribulation saints, uh, because uh, uh, our resurrection, we were not given to marriage, but then we're raptured before the tribulation, right? So it seems like maybe the tribulation saints have something different. Is that the question, yeah, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, so then, yes, that's the correct answer. The correct answer is, yes, they are different. The reason why is because in the book of Jeremiah, it points out that the Bible says that the nation of Israel, when he comes after the tribulation, the millennium, that their numbers will increase, he says. So they're going to build houses and their families will grow. That's what the Bible says. Be besides, you have to think about this too. You also have to think about where does Satan get the number a people like the sand of the sea at the end of the millennium. How does he get that huge number when after the tribulation, Jesus already conquered the nations, sent the uh, sent, uh, cast the dam to hell at Matthew 25? See? So then where do you get this huge number from? It's from, see, repopulation. So it's from the, uh, it's the opposite of what Bill Gates would tell you, right? So then it's the increase of the population right here. Uh, where they, why? Because God made a promise at the book of Jeremiah that they be increased. Another thing to think about is this, is that why there has to be marriage and uh, people increasing is because the Bible uh, says that the nation of Israel, a lot of them will be annihilated. So because a huge number of them are killed and gone, the Bible promised, uh, God promised Abraham that your seed will increase like the sand of the sea. Well, then how is he going to keep his promise? That's why they have to repopulate. There is marriage. So they have a different body compared to ours. And the evidence is Revelation 22 itself. Look at Revelation 22. Their body is built differently from us. Our bodies, remember, is like the body of Jesus Christ. Man, that's some body to have right there. What a huge honor that we got right here. That proves we have to be raptured before the tribulation. Why? Then you get a contradiction with Scripture. It doesn't make sense. God promised you won't get married, but then again, later on, he says you are going to get married. See, there's a contradiction. Unless you divide the saints. These saints are different from these saints. These saints are Christians who says that they're not going to get married. And that has to be before, has to be divided away from these people going to the tribulation. And these tribulation saints, because Israel's program and timeline is restored, Romans chapter 11, Daniel chapter 9, 
That's why they can continue with their repopulation. That's why dispensationalism is such an important doctrine. You don't want to overlook that doctrine. It's so important. It answers so many questions. Not only that, it rescues you from a lot of wrong doctrine and heresy out there. Because you can't debunk speaking in tongues without dispensationalism. Because you believe that those signs were for Israel and it was a different time period, different group of people. All right, now, anyway, Revelation chapter 22, notice there, uh, it's different. Look at verse 2. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which had bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. How can they do that right there? I thought that our bodies in Philippians chapter 2 and 3, that they're immortal, well, they're immortal and that it has no flaw, un incorruptible, 1 Corinthians 15. Why Revelation 22, it gets healing. It's because if you believe what the Bible says at the book of Isaiah, at the millennium, a good person will, uh, a, a, a wicked sinner would live about 100 years during the millennium, whereas a, a, a saint would live much longer. See, it shows that it's longevity, not immortality. It's longevity right here. Whereas the saved Christians, it is immortality. All right, uh, good question. The no more sea part is actually simple, is that the Bible talks about there was no more sea. And this is referring to, but the Bible says that the earth, uh, the, pre, the earth already was wiped away at Revelation 20, right? Well, then if Revelation 20, the earth with its ocean was already wiped away, why would Revelation 21 later say there was no more sea? There's a difference going on here. This, if you look up the word sea in the book of Revelation, it's not just uh, the, part, the oceans in the earth. Yeah. It's referring to that, yeah, you got it. You know your Bible, sea of glass up there. When God sees sea, his sea is not the, the dirty Atlantic Pacific Ocean. When he says sea, he's seeing his clean sea right there. Mm-hmm. All right, good question, sir. All right, do we have other questions? Yes, sir, the back. Yes, sir. On uh, uh, Luke 24, uh, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, um, I, have, I don't know, uh, I feel like it's Simon. Uh, that's uh, the, the message is one of them, two across, but the other one, uh, yes. I can't really make sense of it. Yeah. So basically, who's the identity of uh, the uh, two people at the road? Yeah. Uh huh. You have? Uh, can you give me the passage? Of which book and chapter again? Uh, what what book and chapter again? Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Luke twenty four. Uh huh. Luke twenty four. Yes, uh, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. Uh-huh. So then uh, your question is referring to you're not sure if the two people who are with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, you're not really sure if one of them is Simon or not, right, because of that statement? Okay, then. Uh, does it, is it more like a, uh, I guess you're more on the side of, I don't think it's Simon because uh, he, they already mentioned Simon. Oh, you're sure it is, right? Oh, okay, I see, I see that. So then you believe it is, but then uh, the other side, the critics are bringing up this passage, right, at verse 34? No, this is me, general, this, that maybe kind of think it is. Oh, I see, I see what you're saying, okay, okay. So the question is basically this, the question is, is that when these two, you know the road to Emmaus, there were two people who went on the road with Jesus, and then Brother uh, Jack is wondering if one of them could be Simon, why? Because of what verse 34 says, uh, saying the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. Because let's look at the top right here. Verse 33, 33. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. So it seems like a confirmation that it's Simon, but uh, to me, I think not. I have to think differently because uh, what I think over here is that verse 33, uh, they went to the 11, it says right there. Yeah. 
Yeah, they went to the 11. So it has to include Simon Peter here. So me, I don't think that uh, the two people on the road to Emmaus, one of them is Simon. There are other Bible believers who believe that it is Simon Peter. I'm, uh, I'm definitely open to that. Uh, but I need more scriptural points because what I see here is I kind of go with the other traditional uh, Christians where it's two people who walked on the road to Emmaus, but we are not sure 100% who it is. Uh, but there is a clue with 1 Corinthians 15 about the sequence Jesus did, right? So let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. I think the statement about like the Lord hath, uh, the Lord hath appeared to Simon, that it could be a statement referring to before that time before the road to Emmaus. Sometimes Jesus appeared to Simon. Uh, but uh, I just don't know when or where it was. But let's look at right here. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then notice that the Bible reads here at verse uh, 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. So then Cephas is referring to Simon Peter. Then of the twelve, which is the uh, Matthias and then the other apostles. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. So uh, what I see right here at verse 6, it could be that the two who met Jesus on the road is included in that 500, uh, 5, uh, 500, excuse me. Why is that? The reason why is uh, it, it's going to, uh, when people try to find out the identity of the names of these two people, I think that uh, God put it anonymous to, because pointing out 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6, he put 500 as anonymous. So if the two people are anonymous, and then 1 Corinthians 15, 6, these people are anonymous. I think it's the same group. It's the anonymous group that Jesus appeared to. But uh, that's of my own opinion over here. Another thing is when we look at Luke 24 and verse 13. And behold, two of them, verse 13, and behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Uh, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Uh, verse 21, But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them, which were with us, went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Now notice that these two people talked about verse 24, about the people who went to the sepulchre. See that? Who is that? That's verse 12 before verse 13. Before they went to the road to Emmaus, these two people. Verse 13, Peter went to the sepulcher. See that? He didn't say we went to the sepulcher. He said, uh, he said uh, let's see right here. Ver, uh, them. He said them at verse 24. So it seems like that uh, these two people, I think, uh, in my opinion, would be the anonymous people would be the anonymous people. Now, there is a point you can make for Peter, though. The point you can make for Peter is verse 12. It says, arose Peter, ran to the sepulcher, and he was wondering what came to pass, right? And then immediately, the verse says in verse 13, and behold, two of what? Them. 
See, right there? So it may follow the context of Peter right there. I don't know. But it's interesting. Then maybe we can find the identity of the other person. Maybe it could be John then. Because remember, Peter and John was the one that went to the sepulcher to see. But then uh, the Bible continues the two of them, right? So who knows? But uh, that's my two cents on that one. It's something to think about. Uh, that's a, isn't it fun to be a Bible believer? Everybody wondering and studying for themselves, right? Uh, if, if I don't have a 100% answer, that's not something to go, oh, that's so sad. No, that's exciting. That means, wow, that encourages me to study for myself, and maybe I can find some more clues. All right. Do we have uh, other, other questions? Okay, <laughs> Sheila, go ahead. Don't worry, sister. Amen. Okay. I'm already liking this because it's chronic. All right. Ah, okay. For, can you uh, give me the passages again? 830. All right. And the next one? Nine thirty nine, okay. Let me read that quickly. Uh. All right, let's start off with first Chronicles one. Uh, thirty three through thirty four, right? All right, here we go. Uh, and Ner begat Kish, and Kish begat Saul, and Saul begat Jonathan, and Malchishua, and Abinadab, and Eshbal. And the son of Jonathan was Meribal. And Meribal begat Micah, and the sons of Micah were Pithon and Melech and Tereah and Ahaz. And Ahaz begat Jehoiada, and Jehoiada begat Elameth, and Asmaveth, and Zimri, and Zamri begat Moza. Okay, now let's look at Second Chronicles 9. Let me, it repeats the same thing, okay. I want to read it again, though, just in case. Uh, that way I can see some wordings here. Chapter 9, verse what again? Is it chapter 9? That, uh, I think that's wrong of 2 Chronicles 9. I'm there. It only has 31 verses. Okay, 1 Chronicles 9. Okay, 1 Chronicles. Okay, not 2. 1 Chronicles 9, 39. Yeah, so Kish begat Saul, Saul begat Jonathan, Malshua, Benadash, Baal, Marabal, Marabal, Baal. Okay. Yeah, it's the same thing right here. Uh huh. Okay. Let's look at the book of 2 Samuel. Gives me, gets me interested something here. Let's go to 2 Sam, uh, first, 2 Samuel, excuse me. We're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter... Nine. Second Samuel chapter nine. All right, then, let's look at his genealogy right here. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 4. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto him, The king, behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Okay, now it makes me wondering. I don't think he is mentioned at all, right? In verse 6, verse six he's mentioned. Yeah, but in the genealogy, I wonder if Macher's mentioned at all. Now it makes me curious. Let's look at, uh, I'm looking at First Chronicles 8, 33. I don't see him anywhere either. Okay, then. This is what, no, 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 no. I think I, ha uh, I have several theories, actually. So I have several theories, but I'm trying to find a more certain answer, actually. So I think it's this, is that uh, when we look at 2 Samuel chapter 9 and then verse uh, 9 and then also verse 7, I think it's this. It could be two, uh, several possibilities here. One, we see a great picture of New Testament salvation, right? Where basically uh, Jonathan's child, Mephibosheth, basically becomes uh, the child of the King David. David takes him in as his own son. 
Now we take that to teach where Christians have been adopted. So we're, uh, we were the child of the devil, right? We weren't a child of God, but God took us in lowly dogs that we were and made us his child. Maybe it's possible that David took Mephibosheth and put him in his line and then took him and adopted him as his family. And so Mephibosheth adopted and took on King David's lineage. That's possibility one. Possibility two is that First Chronicles chapter 8, the Bible doesn't give uh, Jonathan's uh, all of their children or their line. Uh, why is that? Because maybe it doesn't recognize uh, Mephibosheth, if the first theory is true, you wouldn't recognize Mephibosheth as within the line of Benjamin because the Bible concentrates on the line of Judah, actually, the line of Judah where uh, King David's lineage continues. Another example is this. Another example is this is the more uh, acceptable and traditional answer. If you look at Matthew 1 and even Luke, where it talks about the genealogy of Christ, it doesn't give all the names. It's called an abbreviated genealogy. So that is normal in the scriptures. So that's probably the more logical, more safe answer is that it's an abbreviated genealogy. Why? God doesn't do that. So it's normal in genealogies. You don't get all the names. Uh, you also have to think historically as well. Historically during that time, you know, they didn't have advanced science, DNA, or a computer system to keep records. They passed it on through word of mouth through the manuscripts. So because of that, they had to go by the knowledge and then write it down in scripture, but they can't keep, uh, but obviously during that time, you can't keep track of every single ancestor. That's why Jesus' ancestry is such a miracle. It is truly Bible. It is truly Bible right there. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's my answer to that one. All right, do we have one more question? We'll close it off with one more question. All right. Um, so in Je Judges 11, uh, with Jeff, Mm -hmm. uh, he makes a vow to God, saying, first person to pass through the Lord in my house, I'll offer him up in verse 31 uh, for a burnt offering, and then ends up being Jephthah's daughter. So did he have to, did Jephthah's daughter have to die? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. So, uh, actually, there's a passage, uh, I forgot where in, where in the Bible, but basically, if you break a vow, you can do an offering, actually. So if there's a vow, there's, uh, you don't really have to take it. If you break it, then you just confess it to the Lord and repent. But Jephthah never did that. So there are a couple arguments here. One is that some people see that Jephthah was very noble, that uh, he kept his vow to the Lord, and he didn't want to sacrifice his daughter, so he did, kind of like Abraham and Isaac. There's another side that teaches that Jephthah was very arrogant. So because he was very arrogant, he refused to repent before the Lord. That's the reason why he gave his daughter up as a sacrifice, so, uh, no, I have my integrity with God, you know, kind of like Job. And then, so that's why he kept onward with that one. But uh, what, what every side believes in, concerning about Jephthah's vow and his statement, was that basically it fits up with what the Bible reads about, don't give a foolish vow. So uh, that's what people tend to do, is that they always give foolish vows. So uh, when you go on the uh, good advice is when you get on the altar during your revival meetings, especially ones that are coming up, you know, don't make foolish vows because then you'll feel really guilty later on uh, when you break it. But it doesn't mean that uh, you forsake a commitment to the Lord. You can say, by your grace, just say it that way, by your grace, I commit to do this and this, Lord, will you help me out? And he, I'll stumble in between, but will you help me out? So then you can say it that way, but don't say like, I vow that I'm going to stop smoking, <laughs> drinking and stuff like that because later on then you just feel guilty. And then sometimes the Lord does that to teach you. It is actually pride and arrogance right there a little bit because God wants to teach you how wicked and weak you are. Right. And I think that's what we all learn in life. And when you become uh, a spiritual person one day and the Lord mightily uses you, you're going to remember those times that you thought you were strong, but you let God down. Amen. And that will keep you humble. Right. You know, uh, that, uh, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that no preacher thinks like that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of preachers think about that. When the Lord uses them and they get blessed, they just uh, remember, well, if you only knew how stupid I was. Yeah, but they're not going to blurt it out to you at the blowout, all right? So. <laughs> Maybe during testimony time, you know. <laughs> Maybe during testimony time, you know. <laughs> Who knows? But anyway, I'm just kidding. But that's the answer to your question. 
I don't want to rob people of their questions. So I said that's the last question, but I don't want to rob people of their questions. I know some people wanted to ask me something. If this is what you want to ask, ask it now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> uh, you already had a, asked a question, brother, so we're not going to ask that. All right. Okay, I'll assume that's all. All right. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for your blessed book, Lord. Uh, it's endless. No other science, no other video game, no other new thing, new drug or anything. It's just an old book and always something new. We can read it a thousand times, Lord, and we'll always still find something new. What an incredible book, which is why we always have questions. Open thou our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Help us to get home safely. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.